I would like to, first off, preface this by saying uh, globalization is a trend which seems to me to be accelerating. It's not well defined, but it's happening in vigorous ways in every university that I've seen. Um, I'm particularly aware of this in our local community. Um, the three colleges here that have this special bond, Olin College, Babson College, and Wellesley College, each have aggressive programs underway right now involving partnerships with universities abroad. Uh, I happen to be a trustee at Babson, so I've been watching that program very closely. Um, Babson has a wholly owned subsidiary called Babson Global with its own board of trustees, which actually was one of the legacies of Len Schlesinger's presidency there. And Len happens to be here in the audience, so if you have questions about Babson's global program, Len, would you raise your hand or something? Um, you can talk to him about that. Uh, very aggressive. In fact, they're planning to sign an agreement with Saudi Arabia in a, within a month um, uh, for a larger long-term engagement. They have dozens of other universities. So there's one whole approach to bringing entrepreneurship to the world. That's their vision. Wellesley College also has a lot of things going on and has for a long time. There's a lot of work going on right now in China, a lot of controversy about this issue in China that you can find easily on um, websites now that deal with news in higher education about ethical conflicts that can develop when you work abroad. And um, Joanne Murray can help answer those questions about ethics in the panel that will show up uh, later. Olin's effort to try to change the way STEM education is practiced and to create innovators in the technology world is also what our white paper is about. So you know what we're thinking from reading that paper. Uh, so this is a timely meeting from that point of view. And now I would like to introduce our principal speaker today, uh, Dr. Jamil Salmi, who is one of my most important personal mentors. Uh, Jamil and I met some years ago with an invitation to me to visit the World Bank to just explain what Olin was about. Uh, and Jamil has been um, at the World Bank for at least two decades, and he is um, sort of the principal author of the World Bank's uh, strategy on developing knowledge economies around the world. He's worked in more than 80 countries. Uh, he retired from the bank less than a year ago, and he told me that he's more busy now than he was when he was working for the bank, except he doesn't have staff meetings, which allows him to travel even more, um, which has been great. But he really helped open my eyes to what Olin might be able to do uh, in working with others. Uh, his biography is available in more detail outside. But Jamil, would you come up and talk to us about what globalization is going on? Thank you, Rick. A very good morning to all of you. It's really a great honor for me to be here at All In. You know, in our life, we, we read about people, we admire them from afar, and then when we get the opportunity to meet them, in real life, sometimes we get disappointed. Through my work, I had the opportunity to meet, for example, President Aristide in Haiti or Fidel Castro in Cuba. And while their charisma was undeniable, I was not very impressed. But in June, I had a very great experience meeting in Burma, in Myanmar, Aung San Suu Kyi, the Peace Nobel Prize, and finding out that in real life, she's even more awesome and a great person. And frankly, I don't, Rick is not going to like that, but meet, meet, meeting President Miller was one such experience, very positive experience. I read about Ollie in the first time in this article I don't, in the New York Times, and I asked one of my colleagues, let's try to invite the president of that new venture. And Rick was kind enough to come to the World Bank, and we were so impressed, we organized a visit, 
and came here to Orlin with a few colleagues and then met with staff and faculty. But what was most impressive was, uh, were the students. And I felt the same e energy, passion, enthusiasm last night when I met some of you current students or recent graduates. And being able to count myself as a friend of Orlin is really a great pleasure and intellectual satisfaction. And as I realized that there will be so many distinguished people attending this presentation today, I must confess that it made me quite nervous. And I decided that I needed some help and some inspiration. So um, the night before, I went and walked around right, to get some inspiration from this charming lady who offered to tell me about my future. And I told her that, unfortunately, my future is already behind me. And I'm more interested in knowing about the future of high education. And here is what she told me. In the future, it will be compulsory to go to college. In countries where there is not much interest for engineering education, universities will reach out to kids in kindergartens to start motivating them towards engineering studies. Applicants who have perfect SAT scores will be rejected because of the fear that they would be nerds. In the future, students who need financial aid will participate in an online auction on eBay to get their scholarship. In the future, the validity of a degree will be only five years because things are changing so fast, which means that professors will have to redo their curriculum every three years. But not to worry because the average duration of a class will be only 10 minutes, and most classes will be online anyway. It will be much cheaper to build universities in the future because you'll have iLabs and e-libraries. The salaries of professors will be determined by student evaluations. And the salary of the president of a college will be about a million dollars a year indexed to the ranking of the college. Bad news for public universities, because in the future, they'll get no more than 10% of their income from the state. But they'll be so successful, as all in seems to be, in raising funds that in mid-academic year, they will tell those philanthropists out there, that's enough for this year. Come back next year with your money. And sorry, Leonard, to break the news to you, but forget about the MBA, because in the future, it'll be all about the MFA, the Master of Fine Arts. And in countries where English is not the native tongue, parents will have surgery performed on their young children to cut the little skin that ties the tongue to the mouth to improve their English language pronunciation. Obviously, my parents forgot to do that to me. Now, you may think that I'm telling you science fiction stories, right? I can assure you that each and every example that I've just given you is a real life case that I encountered in one of my trips. And the question for most countries in the world today, faced with this revolution in higher education, is whether their systems are ready to participate. And to answer this question with you this morning, I have divided my presentation into four parts. I want to speak briefly about the importance of knowledge for economic and social development. I want to emphasize how fast the world is changing and how it impacts educational practices. And finally, talk about all in place in this context and the footprint that you have already put and that you are likely to bring about as you engage more in your international efforts. 
A few years back, ex-colleagues of mine from the World Bank did a study comparing two countries, South Korea and Brazil, that were at the same level of economic development at the beginning of the 60s. But if you look at the situation today, a big gap, and South Korea doing much better than Brazil. And to explain the difference, they realized that South Korea, much better than Brazil, had been able to apply new knowledge and technologies, and indeed, to drive to all in today, some of you may have come in a Hyundai or a Kia car. You may have a Samsung cellular phone or at home watching TV on an LG screen. But I'm not sure that you're using high-tech Brazilian products in your everyday life, unless you are the happy owner of an Embraer airplane. An Embraer, a world-leading company, owes its success to a large extent to the fact that from the beginning, the, the Brazilian government set up the School of Aeronautical Engineering, ITA, and they worked very closely together. But that didn't happen in the rest of the economy. Now, it's interesting to see what happens in terms of education development in both countries. On this graph, I'm showing you the level of education of the adult population. Now, in red, it means that people have not gone further than primary education. Blue means high school education. Green means higher education. Now, you can see again that in the 60s, both countries had the same structure. Most people had only primary education, if anything. But if we move fast forward to, if we fast forward to 2010, Korea has changed so much, where half of the people have at least secondary education, 40% higher education. Brazil has improved, but not fast enough. And we still have half of the people with only primary people, for 40% with secondary. This is an ad in The Economist from the province of Ontario in Canada. And it may be hard to read, but to attract foreign investors, they boast about three things. One is that corporate tax is low. Second, government will co-finance research expenditures. And third, more than 62% of the population has a high education degree. A few months back, the Prime Minister of Ontario visited the state of Minnesota and gave a speech where he said that if we think about it, most countries are, face the same advantages in terms of being able to borrow the capital you need, to copy people's other people's technology, or to buy raw materials. There is only one thing left today to build your comp competitive advantage, and that one thing is talent, the talent of your people. A few years back, the president of this country set up a task force on the future of skills to steer the economy in the right way and the training of people. And this is the distribution of labor that this task force recommended. In this country, the focus will continue on creative work, R&D, design, etc., while developing countries from which I come would focus on the routine work performed either by the people or by the machine. You may remember that a few months before Steve Jobs died, he was summoned by President Obama and challenged why are all Apple, most Apple, factories out there in Asia. You're, we are losing all these jobs. But Steve Jobs' response was that it, didn't, it was not a drawback for the US economy, because most of the value is still here. And if you look, for example, at the distribution of the value of an iPad, you can see that the cost of labor in China represents only 2%. 
the big item is the 30% of design, development, and profit that's staying here in this country. That's linked to the technology part and development part. A small story from Finland. 500 kilometers north of Helsinki, the capital city, you will find this city of Ulu in the middle of the forest where the main company would cut trees and make paper and cardboard. But then in the early 70s, the CEO of that company got worried about the future of his industry. And he challenged the government to establish a technology university in Ulu. Now, I can tell you academics in Helsinki were not so keen on moving to the middle of nowhere, but the government thought this is not a bad idea. And they did establish the Technology University of Ulu. And today, if you Google, you will see that the city of Ulu and the university share the same website because their development has been so closely interlinked. Now, what is the name of that company whose CEO had this far-fetching vision? You all know about Nokia, who transformed themselves into a world leader in electronics, at one point contributing 20% of Finland's exports and two-thirds of the country's investment in R&D. Now, you may challenge me and say, this is not a very good example because Nokia is in trouble. And I think a side lesson of this is that being success successful at one point doesn't mean that you will be successful forever if you don't keep improving, and I will not mention BlackBerry here at this stage. <laughs> now, knowledge and technology is not important only for economic development, but also to overcome some of the daily problems of poor people in developing countries. Here is one example, this magic invention called the life straw which allows you to purify water instantly. Now, if you look at progress in the health of the human population over the 20th century, life expectancy has doubled. It's not due mostly to progress in medicine, but to access to clean water. That's what has made such a difference. Or look at the Q-drum which transforms the traditional chore of carrying water from the well to the village into almost a game. Or this $20 artificial knee, by the way, developed by students at Stanford, which is so ingenious that if a person who's lost a limp is wearing it with a long trouser, nobody will see the, notice the difference. And knowledge is also important for improved safety. Progress in seismology, volcanology, climatology doesn't mean that we can prevent cat natural catastrophes from happening, but at least we can prepare much better. And it is indeed a tragedy when the tsunami hit East Asia, South and East Asia on December 26, 2004, to think that the devices that allow to predict how long it will take for a tsunami wave to hit once there was an underwater earthquake was installed on the Western Pacific, uh, Western United States coast and Canada. But even though the technology existed, it was not available in Indonesia, in Sri Lanka, in Thailand, etc. And 200,000 lives were lost. And more recently, when we think about the tsunami in Japan, we look at the terrible effect of the tsunami, but we need to celebrate the fact that even though it was a very strong earthquake, nobody died because buildings were destroyed, because Japan has been so good at incorporating its, the knowledge uh, in terms of building construction. What happened at Fukushima is that a little bit of human arrogance. Nobody thought about protecting the backup generators. And the rest is history. By the way, you know what the instructions were in case of emergency at Fukushima factory? Send a fax to the Ministry of Defense, Nat National Defense. 
And I do believe that engineering schools should do a very deep case study of what went wrong and apparently keeps going wrong at Fukushima and see what needs to be changed in engineering education to avoid repeating this kind of catastrophic events. Last point I want to make in this first part is about the acceleration of creation of new knowledge, which means that in some cases, in some disciplines, what a student learns in first year may have become obsolete by the time she or he graduates. That has implications for the way you prepare your students. Just to illustrate the point, somebody, I don't know if anybody recognizes, the first hard drive, it weighs only 2,000 pounds, 1956, and it's so powerful that you can store up to 128 kilobytes. So you can appreciate this beautiful USB drive that we can carry around. Second part, we need to recognize that our world is changing very rapidly and that affects higher education. You know. When we look at the rankings and see these old universities, Harvard down the road, Oxford, Cambridge, Bologna in Europe, you know, we think that you can go on operating as we have in the past. Just as watching this quiet mountain, it's, everything is peaceful. But if you go closer, you will start hearing a rumble that may be announcing a big avalanche. And I believe that's what's happening in higher education. Uh, I, I want to emphasize three types of factors that are really, uh, that we need to take into consideration. Crisis factors, stimulus factors, and disruption factors. Crisis factor, President Miller and I, you know, talked about the impact on, on all in of the financial crisis. Well, it's affecting many countries worldwide. We see a decrease in public subsidies for, to, for higher education. And at the same time, it's hard to compensate with additional cost sharing because families are also suffering. And in many countries, the employment prospects for young graduates are getting uh, less positive. Just to illustrate with a few statistics, if we look at Europe, for example, in the past five years, we see which countries have had an increase in their resources for higher education or a decrease. Of course, the Scandinavian countries are doing very well, uh, but look at the, can the countries in the bottom, many of them losing more than 10% of their resources. We would see the same thing when we look at the proportion of uh, GDP spent on higher education. And if you look at your country, we see a very gloomy picture. Between 2002 and 2010, we've seen a 20% decrease in real terms in state transfers to public research universities, for example. Per student subsidies have fallen from $10,000 to $8,000. And we see a growing number of top public universities which receive less than 10% of their income from the state. In fact, I ask myself, are they still public universities if 90% of their resources are not public? And as a result, of course, increases in sharp increases in tuition fees. 15% in, in, on average just in three years between 2008 and 2010. And in some states, 40%, Arizona, Colorado, California. I think, Rick, you, may, you showed this graph in, uh, in your, the paper for the previous meeting in California, that in most states in the past five fiscal years, the, the decrease in per student subsidy, only Wisconsin and North Dakota are the exception. I mean, can you imagine 48 states? And I'm always wondering, in the case of your country, about the danger of not having a federal minister of higher education who is able to look at the big picture. So things are happening in each state, but for how long can you decrease funding until the system breaks down? But the news is not only negative, because in some parts of the world, something very positive is going on. 
governments believing that firmly convinced that high education is at the center of high economic competitiveness. Of course, the Asian dragons, the Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, Malaysia of this world, Vietnam, China, the Scandinavian countries, and even the Europe, in theory, with their Lisbon agenda, defined in 2000, putting, uh, the, promising themselves that they will transform their economy into becoming the most competitive economy in the, in the world. And these countries are putting their money uh, behind their words with a number of what I call excellence initiatives. They are not all called excellence initiatives, but basically the principle is that they want to give a boost to the top universities with additional funding. Um, I've been tracing them, and I re did realize that there were two periods. It's starting 1989 through 2004. We have 13 in the world. And then an acceleration in the past seven, eight years, 33 that I've been able to identify. And here are the names of the countries where governments, at one point or the other, have put more resources to upgrade, or in some cases, to establish new universities. Uh, it's mostly Northern Europe and Asia in the first phase, and now the whole of Asia and Europe in the second phase, one country, Nigeria, in the Africa region. And the example of China is very impressive. They started with their 211 program, where they decided that they wanted to invest in having 100 top quality universities by the beginning of the 21st century. And then they moved on to the 985 program with the ambition of developing nine world-class universities. They call them the C9 League, the equivalent of the Ivy League here. And then they extended that to 39 universities. And the results are quite impressive. In the first Shanghai ranking, which focuses mostly on the research universities, there were nine Chinese universities among the top 500. In the latest edition announced a, a, a month ago, already 28 Chinese universities. And since it's a zero-sum game, it means that Universities from other countries have been kicked out of the ranking. Japan, for example, lost 11. And a quote from the Prime Minister of Malaysia to show you the importance they put on these aspects. I do believe that today, human resource development and human capital formation are either extremely important, absolutely vital, or a matter of life and death. In the case of Malaysia, we think it is a matter of life or death. And then we have the disruption factors. New providers, big companies that set up their own corporate university, the MOOCs, for-profit companies, for-profit universities. There is a company in Brazil now that owns universities with one million students representing 45% of the total enrollment of this country. And then the global rankings. Rick told us about US News and World Report. You may not be aware of it, but outside the US, people have become obsessed with the global ranking, the Shanghai ranking, the Time High Education, QS, etc. And it is changing drastically how universities behave how students choose their universities, how governments fund scholarships for overseas studies. And as a result, we see a global talent war. Other countries coming and trying to buy or hire the best brains. If you visit KAUS, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, a new venture in Saudi Arabia, for example, you would be impressed with the talent I, their new president is the former president of Caltech University. And then the impact of internet and new technology, I'll come back later to that. Third consequence, changing education practices. Of course, with the first question we have to ask ourselves, what are the new skills that we need to impart to our students? 
In the same way as 200 years ago, especially in Great Britain, people were worried about the impact of new machines, for example, in the textile mills, on their jobs. Today, we are worrying about the impact of intelligent machines and robots on our jobs. Are we, as human beings, being displaced? As we mentioned in the paper that was uh, given to you for this meeting, there is a very interesting study from two professors, Bernin and Levy, from, respectively from Harvard and MIT, who have looked at this issue, trying to measure the effect on tasks, the evolution of tasks in US companies for the past 30 years. And they give us both good news and bad news. The bad news is that indeed, a in lot of tasks are being now taken over by the machines. Routine manual, routine cognitive, and routine and non-routine manual, where a lot of programming can be done, and the machines can perform much better than human beings. But thank God, we are still useful in some way through what they call two types of complex tasks, which is expert thinking and complex communication. Expert thinking is the ability to look at complicated phenomena and to make sense of them, analyze and act upon them. Just perhaps a good example is what the medical doctor does. You know, medicine, much more education, has changed drastically in the past 20 years. We can use now, we can do sophisticated lab tests, we can do CAT scans, MRI, etc. But it's not the machine, or we can do also telemedicine. Like here we have a, a, a medical robot allowing a to interview a patient 2,000 miles away. But it's not these two new machines that make the diagnosis. It's the, still the human brain looking at all these inputs, all this information, and making sense of it, identifying the problem, and recommending a course of curation. Now, are we doing a good job preparing our students for that? Some of you may be aware of the PISA test administered by the OECD. It's 15 years old in college, in high school, sorry, high schools who are taking this test. And it's not a traditional memory test. It's really testing critical skills through language, science, and math tests. Uh, on a scale of one to six, if you don't go beyond two, it means you haven't mastered the basic skills. And we can see that even for top performer countries like Finland, Korea, Hong Kong, 20% of these 15 years old do not meet the minimum. And then if you look at developing countries like Brazil, Indonesia, up to 90%. So if they're not ready when they leave high school, how are they going to be able to study for these new skills and expert thinking, for example, when they reach university education? And then we have complex communication, the ability to explain complex phenomena, to convince, to persuade, to do that with people from different cultures, to do that with people uh, in remote uh, area or far away from you. Now, I, I couldn't find solid evidence as I did for the expert thinking, so I have to rely on our cousins, the dolphins, who have this to say about human communication. Although humans make sounds with their mouth and occasionally look at each other, there is no solid evidence that they actually communicate among themselves. And if you think about it, when you watch the news, what, what kind of positive news do we see? except images of poverty, violence, inequality, corruption, which makes me believe that we're not doing a great job at preparing humans for positive communication. Now, a friend of mine who teaches at the University of Hong Kong went to interview the president of Samsung Cell, cellular phones, to find out from him what kind of engineers, technicians, and professionals they were looking for. And to his surprise, 
what he heard from the president of Samsung Seriophone was that their problem was not to find engineers or technicians or qualified professionals, but to find the right people who, had, who were ready in terms of design and creativity. Because if you think about it, about the high-tech products that we buy, increasingly the difference is not so much the technical specifications, but how cool they look, how appealing they are. And that's why you can buy today a Prada cellular phone or an Armani George, Samsung Giorgio Armani phone. If you go to Shanghai, this is the latest uh, girl there. And those of you who have teenage daughters may relate to this, uh, to this style. Uh, look at this charming lady with a matching uh, handbag. Well, no, it's not a handbag. It's a matching laptop. And there is something also for us, man. How about the Ferrari laptop? You don't like Ferrari, Rick? What about Lamborghini? Is that good enough? Some of you may remember these not so exciting looking laptops whose brand I'm not going to mention. Uh, well, they have to hire designers, gra graphic artists, to make their products more appealing to compete with another firm whose name I cannot mention either. Well, actually, since uh, Steve Jobs left us, I remember a very nice quote from him. He said something like, technology is not enough. It is technology married with the humanities and liberal arts that enable us to design these products that make our hearts sing. So what is creativity about? It's allowing your students to invent, to experiment, to think out of the box. I didn't know it was allowed in my university. To take chances, to break the rules, to make mistakes as part of your pedagogy, and to have fun. And of course, saying this in Holland, you just can't say, so what? Because that's what you leave. But believe me, in most places in the world, in most universities, that's not how it is. You're not allowed to challenge your professor. You're not allowed to think differently from other people. It's still a big challenge. Now, if knowledge is changing so rapidly, lifelong learning becomes much more important. You have to start very young and continue throughout your life. Here is a 93-year-old Australian PhD graduate being celebrated. And please don't accuse me of gender imbalance. So you can learn on both sides of the gender barrier. Today's universities look pretty much like this pyramid. Most students are, well, you know, I'm not talking about colleges like all in, but out there in the universities, are, most of the students come from high school, and they have some um, postgraduate studies. My prediction for the future is that universities will look more like this five um, branch star, where undergraduate studies and graduate studies will just be part of the activities, but perhaps more importantly, we'll see continuing professional development, career change studies because young people will have diff a series of jobs, not doing the same job with a series of companies, different professions. And we shouldn't forget the importance of citizenship and life skills. And of course, education will be not only on campus, but also online or in a hybrid form. Our universities will reach out in an itinerant mode or all the, of these uh, modalities. So if, if continuing education becomes so, so much more important, it means that we need not only to keep learning, but also to unlearn what is not useful anymore. Alvin Toffler once wrote that the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those people who cannot read and, and write. It will be those people who cannot unlearn and relearn continuously. You may remember Edwin Land, who inv invented the Polaroid, and who once said, it is not that we need new ideas, but we need to stop having old ideas. And perhaps to illustrate this change in the pedagogical paradigm for you, 
Let me share an anecdote from Einstein's life. As you know, he used to travel around giving lectures. And one evening, sitting in the back of his chauffeur-driven limousine, he let go a big sigh. <sighs> so the driver looks in the mirror and says, what's wrong, professor? Oh, I'm so tired of giving these lectures. But it's so easy for you. What do you mean, so easy? Well, you always give the same lecture. True, but you know, it's a very sophisticated theory. The driver said, yeah, but you know, I've, I, I've heard it so many times. I think I could give you a lecture. Oh, so you think, OK, I challenge you. They get to the auditorium. Einstein sits in the back. The driver comes to the podium. And you know what? He must have had a good memory because he starts presenting the theory of relativity quite successfully. Big applause at the end of the lecture. Einstein is not very happy. Then the moderator says, do you mind if we ask a few questions? Then Einstein says, ha, ah, now what are you going to do? But the driver says, sure, please go ahead. And you know what? People always ask the same questions. <laughs> so the driver answers without any difficulty. Einstein is really getting very upset. And then the moderator said, OK, one last question. Who wants to go? And then a gentleman in the middle of the audience stands up, a little bit aggressive, says, Professor Einstein, this is all very well, but you've told us only about your past work. Could you please share with us the next step in your scientific inquiry? So now the real Einstein in the back for the first time smiles. I've got you. But the driver doesn't stop, looks at the gentleman in the eyes and says, Sir, I don't mean any disrespect, but in my long career as a professor, I've heard many stupid questions, and yours is so dumb that I'm going to ask my driver in the back to answer it. <laughs> now, if you think this is a real picture, you really believe in science fiction stories. So the new pedagogical approaches, as you practice them in, in all in, is to focus on the needs of the learners, not what the teacher likes to teach. We can learn in a, new, in a variety of modalities, interactive and collaborative, especially from our peers. And here a picture, I don't want to show you pictures from all in, so this is not too far from the classroom in, at MIT. And this is a robot teaching English in Korea. By the way, Korea is the country where this surgery is taking place to improve English language pronunciation. Now, do these kids look unhappy? They're smiley. So they were asked, why do you prefer the robots to the human teacher? Two reasons. One, the robot never screams at us. And two, the robot never makes fun of us. Think about it. And this is another medical robot, Martha from Sweden. I took this picture at the University of Arizona. Now she feels and she speaks. So if you're practicing an injection on her, for example, if you do a good job, she will thank you with a very sweet voice. But if you hurt her, she will tell you in no uncertain terms, I, don't, I dare not repeat the kind of words she would use, what she thinks about your poorly acquired new skills. So what does this all mean for all in? Now, since I have a captive audience, you know, I, Rick explained that I left the World Bank a year and a half ago. I used to live in Washington, DC. And the housing market has been lousy, so I haven't been able to sell my property. I'm told there are quite some wealthy people here, so allow, indulge me for half a minute. For sale, a charming and peaceful Residence away from neighbors with a wonderful view of the sea, a grand period staircase, and lots and lots of light. Hundred thousand dollars. It's a, it's a bargain. Any taker? Do you need additional information? A picture, maybe? Sure, that's fair enough. How's that? What? I didn't lie. It's peaceful. No neighbors. Wonderful view of the sea. Lots of light, etc. How about this one? Not much better. Well, I was lying, right? It was. And the point I want to make is that we have a proliferation of high education institutions all over the world, so rapidly growing. But most of them 
are deceiving their students. They're not offering the quality of relevant education that they are promising. And that's, I think, where all in makes a big difference. Now, the problem for you is that since you are not a graduate, you don't have a graduate school, you don't have, you don't do research, although some of the academics do research, but as an institution, there is no way you will ever be picked up by the current global rankings. You can see the top 50 in the Shanghai ranking, 35 US universities. These are the big research universities. And yet, as we mentioned in the paper, you get so many unsolicited visits, spontaneous visits. You, just by word of mouth, people are getting to know the all-in experience. And let me tell you from my point of view, as an external observer who works on higher education throughout the world, why, what is appealing with all-in? First of all, you have an innovative and integrated curriculum and pedagogy. You know, some of the examples that I gave, you will have universities having one part, one class. And if you look at MIT, nothing against MIT, it's a great school, but uh, this new uh, TL that I showed you, that was not embraced by everybody with enthusiasm. You know. So you have pockets of innovation. The big difference, all in, is an innovation in itself. The whole of the education approach. Design-based learning, team-based work, interdisciplinary, and integration of entrepreneurship with your partnership with Babson College. That's unique in the world. And I like to show around, I think I'm one of your best ambassadors showing around the, the dynamic, dynamism that you see just with picture, the, the energy. Second, ethics and values being such an important part of your education, and that's the partnership with Wellesley College. A few years ago, I went to a conference in Hiroshima, Japan, and the mayor of Hiroshima came to open the meeting, and of course, he talked about the sad events, the tragic events of August 6, 1945. But instead of going on about the bad Americans who dropped the atomic bomb, he made a point which has stuck with me. He said, this is the worst example in human history of the application of modern science. And this is why your focus on bringing ethics as a core part of your curriculum and your philosophy is so important. And then the built-in continuous improvement model. Rick challenged you today to be critical because that's how they think that they keep learning. You know, so many universities I visit, I see a high level of complacency, just like this cat looking at the mirror. At only, not only you don't think that you are better than you are, but you always think, how can I make, do better? How can I keep learning? How can I keep improving? So I do believe that this, the curiosity of the outside world and this request for partnership presents you with many useful opportunities to spread the model and the messages that you are trying that you've been experimenting with since the opening of All In. But then I think that by doing that, you can enrich your own education experience. A few years back, we were doing a midterm evaluation of a project we have in Chile. Chile is one of the most advanced countries in the developing world, quite sophisticated. We had a colleague in Niger from Nigeria, from our Nigeria office, who wanted to learn about higher education. So as part of our cross-fertilization uh, philosophy, we brought him with us in Chile. And because he came from a different background and environment, he started asking basic questions that the Chileans would not ask themselves. And they couldn't answer them. And these were very important questions. Why are you doing this? Why? 
And so I believe that through your international partnerships, you can also enrich your own experience. But you have to be aware of the risks and challenges. Spreading yourself too thin. I could invite Rick Miller to 30 events during the year. I'm lucky if I can get him once a year. And, and there is only one of him. And there is only one of each one of you who has responsibilities at Orange. And then the potential conflicts with your own values. And that's part of today's agenda. You know. Do I want to work in Saudi Arabia, where women are not allowed to drive? Do I want to work in China, where the human rights re record is so poor? Do I want to work in Russia, in Kazakhstan, etc.? These are questions I face every day. And yet, I do work in these countries because I believe that, if anything, it's only through education that we can transform them. But that's where it's very important to choose your partner institution, to make sure that they share the same philosophy, and to have clear rules of engagement. So I think that you need to develop your international cooperation model that will be all in special model that will reflect your philosophy and values, you need to develop a knowledge transfer methodology. Because it's not only about, it's not about copying all-in and doing an, a Saudi all-in, a Brazilian all-in. No. It's see what are some of the core principles and how would they be adapted in the, to, to reflect different conditions in the context where you would go. And for that, you need to assign people who will be working on that, not just as a side additional activity, and develop the know-how. And you need to construct a business model. You know, you've been hard, hardly hit by the crisis. You cannot afford to just this, take some resources from here to help, no matter how needed this help is. And you need to apply the principles that you apply in your everyday work to this international national work as well. How do you monitor, how do you evaluate to see what is working and what you can bring back also to enrich your own experience. In conclusion, since we are talking about the future, let me share with you my favorite quotes, three quotes about the future. First one is from a British science fiction writer, some of you may know, William Gibson, who says that the future is already here. The problem is that it is unevenly distributed. The second one is a bit pessimistic from the French philosopher Paul Valéry, who wrote, the trouble with our times is that the future is not what it used to be. But the one I like most is optimistic from Alan Kay, who wrote in 1971, that we shouldn't care too much about what other people say about the future. The best way to predict the future is to invent it. Alan Kay, as some of you know, invented the Macintosh Windows-like environment. And I believe that part of what Olin is doing is really inventing the, store, the, the future. In a world that is becoming much more complicated, the Chinese word for crisis has two ideograms, which I will not try to pronounce. But I'm told that the first one means a time of danger, and the second one means a time of opportunity. There are many opportunities that you can seize in a world where competition is becoming tougher every day. And I come from North Africa, so let me tell you an anecdote from my part of the world about competition. We have in my country, Morocco, this gracious animal called the gazelle. Gazelles have a terrible life because every morning they get up thinking, today, once again, I need to run faster than the fastest lion if I don't want to be eaten up alive. Now, do lions have a bet better life? I'm not so sure because every morning they get up thinking, today, once again, I need to run than the, fast the slowest gazelle if I don't want to starve by the end of the day. And the moral of this story 
is that it makes a difference what you are, gazelle, lion, small university, big university, poor university, large university, rich university. The world outside is not waiting for you to get your act together. And so you need to decide where you want to go. And I know that this is not a very pleasant world I'm describing. Where it is about the rule of the strongest or the most patient. <laughs> not a very nice world, but that's the only world we have. And I think if we're going to survive in this world of fierce competition, it will be through collaboration and partnerships. And I encourage you very much to move in that direction consciously with a good business plan to do that, to keep making Olin's footprint bigger and bigger. So please keep extending the hand. <laughs>